Glory to God. Man, that is awesome. I'm serious. Mm. Uh, yes, that's, a, that's, that's great. Uh, serious. I, I was talking before the service with uh, Chris and Isaac and Naley, some in the sound room and, and the media area, and I, I made the comment. I said, you know, I don't think our I don't think the our praise team does any duds, you know. I'm, I, I mean, I think <laughs> I think they're all to, like like top songs. Um, most of the time, I'm sure that you guys that are listening online and certainly out here, if you listen to if you listen to um, contemporary gospel music, K Love uh, stations like that, uh, you've heard all of these songs, and and they're they're really great, and our band does them great, and just encourages us to worship and praise the Lord. And that's just a, a wonderful gift that God has given us to be encouraged this way and to build our, our uh, enthusiasm about the things of God and the things that he does. Uh, we're in a series called Change Your Life. Um, a pretty bland name, but uh, hopefully uh, the information and the, and the word has been uh, encouraging to you and continues to be encouraging. Um, I have one more week after this week, uh, assuming that I'm going to get through everything today, which I, which I've been, I've been dragging you guys through uh, an hour's worth, uh, you know, and trying to get all ten of these things because I, I really believe it's important for you to see the whole concept of what what I'm sharing about in these ten laws because people uh, all everywhere in my uh, nearly fifty years of ministry, every church I've ever been in has uh, basically said, Pastor, share with us things that, that are relevant from the Word, things that matter. Uh, not that the Word doesn't uh, matter in every way, but there are sections and parts and there are concepts that fit together that really can affect our lives. And that's just what God wants. I mean, the Bible is a book from the Lord to change our lives and to tell us how to live and show us and, and make things important to us. Well, one of the problems that we have is that there are so many things that are said in the Word about uh, many of the major areas of life, like uh, your mind, your mouth, your finances, your marriage, your relationships, uh, your ministry, uh, all of these things just have hundreds of verses usually and, and many different concepts that come from the old and new. And, and, and so we get kind of lost in some of these things and, uh, and we don't understand what it is that needs to be a part of our life in order for our life to change. So this is an attempt to simplify that for you and to say, all right, and not that I'm infallible or that I don't miss some of the things and so forth, but this is a real effort to put before you in a concise manner t 10 things about each of these ma major areas of life that if you do these things, if you observe these things, then your life will change. It, it will. It, it, it can't help but change. If you do these things, and these are the 10 Greatest concepts are the most often uh, mentioned and used words to talk about each of these areas of life. Now, today I'm going to talk about marriage. And I started to really uh, just kind of broaden this a little bit to talk about relationships in general. But uh, these laws are really about people who have committed to each other, who have made a, a covenant relationship, and how to have uh, an enduring relationship of marriage. And no matter how old you are, or how long you've been married, whether you're someone planning to be married, you're newlyweds, or you're further on down the line, uh, these are the things that matter in your marriage. Now, in this, uh, not that I'm an expert, I don't know if there are any marriage experts, but I have been married for 44 years, Pastor Tanya and I. So there is a little proof in the pudding of, of longevity here. And, uh, and so uh, these things that I say to you are just accumulations of uh, what the Word says and what I've experienced in uh, understanding covenant relationships and what we need. There's only one big law concerning marriage, and it's found in the last verse of Ephesians 5. It's often overlooked. 
It's often just read through as if it says something that it really doesn't say. So let me give you the one big rule of marriage. And here it is, it's, uh, I think it's on the screen, yeah. Uh, Ephesians 5, verse 33. This comes at the end of the discussion about husbands submit yourselves to your own husband as unto the Lord. Husbands love your wives. This is, the, this is the accumulative verse at the end of that chapter, verse 33. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, according to verse 33, men and women are commanded by the Lord. I mean, this is not a suggestion. This is not, hey, it would be good if you did this. This is a, a command. Let each one of you do this now because this is what your mate needs. And he says that there are two uh, separate psychological and emotional benefits that we provide for each other and husbands are commanded to supply love for their wife and wives are instructed to respect their husband. Another word, the old King James word was reverence your husband, um, admire your husband. I mean, these are concepts of, of, uh, of, a, of a respectful um, heart toward uh, one who has been called to be the head of this union. And so this is not just simply a manner of semantics as if these two words mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. And, and, and many times the reasons that marriages uh, fail or even are not happy and complete is because we don't understand that we need different things. We don't need the same thing from each other. And God tells us what it is that we need. The needs, the, and, and look, we need what we need. I'm not talking about wants, but we have needs. Men have certain psychological and emotional needs. Women have psychological and emotional needs. And according to Ephesians 5, they're not the same. And so the reason God has called us together is so that we can supply for each other that thing that we cannot supply for ourselves. So how do you do this? And here where the 10 laws come in. I have five laws for husbands about what you can do to show your wife every day um, for her to be secure in the fact that you love her that she marches at the head of your parade, that, that nothing is more valuable that, to, to you than her. Nothing is more important, that you put nothing else ahead of her. She is number one and you love her and there's no doubt about it. And then also, I wanna give five rules to the ladies, five laws to the ladies about how you can, how you can feel your husband's need to be admired, to be respected, to be honored. Because the simple truth is when men are respected, and I'll, we'll talk about this in these five laws, then men interpret that as love and it meets that need in their life. And so all of us believe that our needs are to be met and just as husbands feel I have needs, and you know, you, I deserve for them to be met. Wives, you have the same, you have the same uh, adventure. You have needs. And these needs need to be met, and God commands us to meet these needs for each other. So here we go. Here we go. Five laws for the husband first to show his wife that he loves her. What do you do every day? Come in and say, "I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you." Hey, did you know I love you, I love you, I love you? I mean, is this what it would take in order for her to have the security of being loved? Well, obviously, no, that's not going to work. So what do you do? All right, here's husband law number one, the law of sacrifice. Ephesians 5, 25, which is in the middle of the discussion that comes before verse 33, Here's what it says to husbands, 525 Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives 
just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, this is what Jesus died on the cross for. Jesus died on the cross for his bride, the church, which, of which we are all part of his bride. And he gave himself on the cross so that he could purchase his bride. And so wives need to know that husbands will die for them as quickly as they would draw their next breath. They have to be secure in the fact that you would lay down your life if it took it, if it was necessary, in order to protect and, 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 and take care and love your wife. Now, this is the same oath, basically, that, that soldiers take in protecting the homeland. This is the same kind of thought that uh, firefighters and police officers and, um, and, and, and caretakers go through that say, basically, look, I, I am going to take on the, uh, the, the responsibility that if anything threatens you, if it takes my life, I'll lay my life down. Now, God has called husbands to be three things in their home. Throughout the word, these three things just continually are, are, are presented that husbands are to be. We are to be the protectors of our home, we are to be the providers for our home, and we are to be the priest for our home. Now, I don't want to get too technical and go long-winded on this any more than I normally do, but, uh, but uh, anything that comes against the home, psychological, spiritual, emotional, uh, any threat that might come against the home. I am to protect my home. That is my job. I am to know what it is, the danger of it, and I'm to see it coming, and I am to move against it. Um, I am to provide for my home. Not that my wife can't work, not that we can't have two salaries, uh, but I am responsible for providing for my family and that I do everything possible in order to make a better life for my family. I go back to school at night if I have to, to get more credentials and more skills in order to, get, to make more money so that our lives can be easier and better. I look for better jobs. I, I mean, I, I just am constantly looking for ways to provide for my family. This is this is what I do. And, and then I'm the priest of my home. I'm responsible for everything that spiritually happens in my family. It's not my wife's job to get the kids to church or to put spiritual things in their life or to pray for them or to open the Bible and read. It is my job to do that because I am, I am the shepherd of the family and I will sacrifice myself for my family. Genesis 2, 24 says this, and this, by the way, is also said in the 31st verse of Ephesians 5. So this, this verse, is, this concept is mentioned in both the Old and New Testament. Here's what it says. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So we obviously know that this is a command that is given by the Lord that we are supposed to observe because he said it to, to a couple of people who did not even have a mother and father. He, he made the statement to Adam and Eve who, who didn't have a mom and dad. And so this is, this is a principle that the Lord wants us to know that we are responsible to be glued, welded to each other and that, and that there is nothing that is to come between us, our children, our in-laws, our uh, former lives, our parents, or anything, that this is the number one relationship in our life, and anything that comes against my family, Dad, I must stand up against it quickly. Now, you don't have to overreact, and you don't have to go wild on things, but you do have to uh, make the effort to protect your family. Now, when your wife sees your sacrifice, she's going to interpret your sacrifice as love. Husband law number two, the law of honor. First Peter three, 
verse seven. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, honor means to set a high value on. It means to uh, place attention on. It means to lift up, uh, to place above. So Peter tells us that we are to honor our wives. We're to put a high value on them, that they are to be precious to us, and we are to honor them. And here's what Proverbs, here's what Solomon says in Proverbs as to setting this high value. This is chapter 31, a great chapter on a virtuous woman. Verse 10, who can find a virtuous wife? And you might ask, what is virtuous? It means every good thing that you could say about them. It means smart, it means capable, it means beautiful, it means uh, wonderful, it means uh, hardworking. Any positive term that you can name is part of being a virtuous person or a virtuous wife here. For, now look, here's what he says. Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. So guys, God sends us wives in order to be a favor to us, in order to bless our lives, to increase our lives. Here's, here's it said in one verse, Proverbs 18, 22, uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So our wife is a gift from God and God gives them to us in order to bring favor into our lives. So honor her with gifts, with comforts, uh, thoughtfulness, uh, being polite, being uh, uh, chivalrous, uh, doing all those little things that, that, that we would do to someone that we would want to honor. I mean, treat her like a head of state. Treat her like a special person in your life. Give her the best. I mean, give her the best car. You take the junk. Give her the best clothes. If somebody gets something new, uh, it, it would be her. If it, the comforts of life, whatever you can provide and supply for her, uh, and you take the junk if there's any junk to be taken. And when you honor her in this way, she interprets that as love, all right? Husband law number three, the law of affirmation. Affirmation to affirm somebody means to speak positively or to acknowledge their strengths. Uh, it's a positive word about them, all right. Here's what Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for Now here's verse 26. That he might sanctify, which by the way means to be set apart. All right, so Christ is going to set his church apart and cleanse, which means to pronounce her clean and pure by the washing of water by the word. Now, I know that this is talking about what Christ does for the church. Christ sets us apart and he pronounces us clean and pure by his word. Now, even though that's about Christ and his church, I think that, um, that it, this really crosses over and, and, and gives us a good view or an understanding of what our wives might need in the area of affirmation. I mean, the comparison here is Christ and the church. The whole chapter is about Christ and the church and how it reflects husbands and wives. And, and, and I think that the reminder here is very subtle. It, and, and the apostle Paul tells us that men are excited men are, are fed through their eye gate, but that women are fed through their ear gate by words. And words are very important in the lives of our wives. They mean, they're, they're tremendously impactful. 
And so the words that we say set them apart. The words that we say uh, pronounce them clean and pure and worthy and, and, and honorable. And it, it, we, they're, they're by, it's by words that we speak. Now, to give you an idea, uh, in Proverbs 31, when the Lord is describing the gifts that this virtuous wife receives because she's wonderful in every way. If you've ever read Proverbs 31, this is a wonderful woman that does everything amazingly. And at the end of that chapter, she gets some gifts. And I want you to notice what kind of gifts she gets. This is beginning at verse 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is the value of words. Her children bless her. Her husbands bless her. Her reward is that people say great things about her, the people that she loves. Also, I want to take you quickly to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is a love poem between Solomon and the love of his life, which is which in the book and is called in the chapters are called the Shulamite woman. But I want to just use that to show you what it is that excites the Shulamite woman. If you, if you read the book uh, and be ready for a little bit of a shock because it is pretty, uh, you know, pretty erotic actually, um, it, the, Solomon in speaking about his Shulamite woman love of life describes all these physical characteristics of her. But this is what she says excites her about him. This is in Solomon, Song of Solomon 5, verse 2. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew and my locks drop uh, uh, with the drops of the night. Uh, it's his voice that excites her. It is, the, it is the, the voice of my beloved one that, that moves her in life. So if you want to keep the honey in the honeymoon, you're going to have to talk to her. And talking is very important. And you're going to have to compliment her worth. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to praise her value her beauty, her feelings, her wisdom, her excellence. You have to say these things. They have to be words that actually come out of, out of your mouth. And now to add another kicker to this, there was a study done, and I've cited it several times, so I won't go into all the details, but between it, with, with some uh, high school boys and girls, uh, like seniors, and they went in and they set up a room with, uh, with two chairs in it. And they would call a couple of la- uh, girls in and they would put them in that room together and they would say, all right, uh, guys, take it easy for just a minute and we're gonna be back in just a few minutes and we're gonna start our little uh, work here. But the whole test was to see what the girls did when no one was in there with the chairs especially and what they did with each other. And so they found in this study that girls, when they were left alone for some length of time and they were going to you know, just uh, kill a little time waiting for something, when they talked to each other, they took the chairs and they moved the chairs face to face. The boys moved the chairs side by side. So the inference is that women enjoy conversation and communication face to face and men prefer side to side. And if you've ever watched men, how you doing? 
All good. Hey, you come down here very much. I mean, we occasionally take a little glance to the side, but we can have a whole conversation just sitting right beside somebody and never, you know, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah you come here often? Yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Women enjoy that face-to-face. So what, a, what, what does that mean as a kicker to this thing of using words? Well, it means, it means don't just, you can't just sit beside her watching TV and not say anything, you know? I mean, you can't be having some kind of admiration for her in some way and not talking to her. You have to, and, and if you do it face-to-face, it's just so much more impactful. It's like, you guys have seen couples at restaurants, right? And you've gone into a restaurant and you've seen young people, uh, most of the time, younger people, and maybe they're on their second or third date and they're in this restaurant and what are they doing? They're sitting at a table and they're sitting across from each other face to face. And they, got, they, they might have their hands stretched out on the table and they're touching each other's hands and they're talking to each other and they're looking into each other's eyes and they're smiling and they're laughing and they're just saying things and they're pleasant and they're, you know, doing and they're just wonderful. And maybe the guy will reach down and maybe he'll kiss her hand, you know, every now and then or something. Well, there was an older couple that, was, that were in the restaurant. And of course, the wife was watching this young couple and she said to her husband, she said, why don't you ever do that? And he said, well, honey, he said, I don't even know that woman. And now, you know, you got to communicate face to face and, and pay attention and, and, and quit fiddling with stuff. Put that, for heaven's sakes, don't be looking at a cell phone. Look at them, listen to them. They are valuable You're trying to honor them. You're wanting them to feel their worth and their worthiness and that they're interesting enough for you to quit doing what you're doing to listen to what they say or to talk to them about something. That's what this is all about. And and so you want her fantasies to be about you, then face-to-face affirmation says, I love you, you're interesting, you're worthy, I'm blessed by you. And she perceives affirmation as love. Let me give you the fourth one, the law of security. We've had sacrifice, honor, affirmation, and now security. This is Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter three. Book of Ruth is about uh, a young lady that comes home with an older lady named Naomi. She comes back to a foreign land and uh, they have a kinsman there that can redeem her and his name is Boaz. And here's what she says to him, verse eight, Ruth three. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled. This is Boaz. That Boaz is startled and he turned himself and there a woman was lying at his feet. So here is Ruth that has come in in the middle of the night and gotten down by Boaz's feet and, sa- and he said, who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing. The literal phrase there is, lift up the corner of your blanket and cover me. What she's asking Boaz to do is to cover her, to protect her, to provide for her. She's seeking security from Boaz. Take me under your wing, for you are a kinsman redeemer. And by the way, this did work. They did get married. It's a wonderful story. Read the book of Ruth. It's great. God's a genius is what I'm saying to you. Look. How in the world did God get two distinctly different genders of humanity that are different in almost every way? We think different. We act different. We communicate differently. We have different desires. We have different needs. How in the world could God make sure that we would get together so that the earth could be repopulated and that the whole plan wouldn't fail because we couldn't stand to be with each other. Well, God's a genius. And I say that with great uh, respect, Lord, you know that. Uh, What he did is he built women with just a tinge, 
And I know that there might be some that would argue about this. I don't care how successful you are. I don't care how smart you are, powerful you are. You were built, if you're a woman, you were built with just a tinge of insecurity. Men, however, no matter how we are, where we could be in the slow class or we we could be way down at the bottom of the line, but regardless of that, men have been built with a little bit, a tinge of confidence in, in them. And so the insecurity of women see the confidence of men and it's like a magnet, boom, and attraction, presto, attraction is made. And so, and so the law of security is that women seek security in life and if you will provide security, this will say to her that you love her. I don't know about you guys, and I, I mean, this might be a little off balance here, but I mean, have you ever noticed people that, ma- that are married to each other? And have you ever thought to yourself, how in the world could that beautiful woman be, be married to that guy? I mean, you've seen them, it's like, they might not have one attractive quality about, about their whole life, face, life, body, whatever it might be, and you're sitting there going, how in the world did that happen? How could somebody like that be married to somebody with none of these credentials? Well, you know, you might be all that, and of course, I'm not talking about anybody in this room, of course, but, you know, you might be all that and a bag of chips. You know, you might have... Uh, a beautiful body, a beautiful face. You might be a, some cover guy for something. You know I mean, you just you're just a beautiful, wonderful person, and you might have all those attributes. And she may love your big arms and your big chest and your big belly. Well, uh, not your big belly, but she may love all of that about you. But there are many women that certainly could not say that about about their mate. But yet they are in love and they are happily married to somebody that wouldn't even be in their league as far as looks go because that person gives them security in life. This law says anything you do to make her more secure tells her that you love her. Communicate with her. You've heard me say this before, I think, a few weeks ago when I, in one of the voice, uh, one of the laws of the mouth, I said, look, tell her where you're going and tell her, are are we going to a five-star restaurant or are we going to McDonald's? Because it really matters, right? What you're going to wear and how you're going to be and so forth. Tell her what you did with the babies, uh, uh, how you got the money. I mean, just communicate and be open and, 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 and whatever you do, don't fool with the finances and make the finances shaky and, and, and stir things up, you know, in, in the area of security in her life. Because I'm going to tell you, when she begins to feel insecure, she's going to start asking a bunch of questions about things and she's going to be very demanding and, and her life is going to be rattled here. So know what it is that upsets her, know what it is that bothers her, that makes her shaky, and then do your best to eliminate that. And when you do, it says to her, I love you. All right, fifth law. Fifth law is the law of excitement. I'm gonna hit it real quick. Add a little hot sauce. uh, I think you can understand this. Uh, The law of excitement. In John chapter two, Jesus' first miracle happens at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. You remember what Jesus did, right? Jesus took water, bland water, and he turned it into wine. An exciting, you know, it added to the festivities. And as a matter of fact, the master of the feast said, it not only was wine, it was the best wine. I mean, it was just amazing. And everybody celebrated and was exciting. Now, I don't want to make too much out of this, but I do want you to notice what Jesus did. Jesus took regular old bland, plain old water and made something exciting about it. I mean, Jesus didn't have to turn water to wine. It wasn't necessary for him to do that. 
But he did it, he added a little spice to this, to this, to this wedding that was gonna go down the tubes very quickly. So what does this say about the law of excitement? Well, it just simply, uh, chore, the chores of a family, taking care of the kids, uh, cooking, washing clothes, cleaning, scheduling, I mean, all of that kind of stuff, just day after day after day after day after day after day can feel like slavery, right? I mean, break the monotony. Uh, Okay, Tarzan, you know, rescue Jane from the mundane here. I mean, let's add a little hot sauce in life. Be creative a little bit in life. Even something simple, go out to eat. Make all the arrangements, get everything taken care of. Walk on the beach, go to a movie, take a weekend trip, leave the kids at home. Leave a sweet romantic note on her pillow or on the refrigerator, somewhere where she'll see it. Bring home some flowers or candy. Stop. You don't even have to buy stuff. Just stop on the side of the road and, you know, there's some pretty flowerful little weeds that are almost everywhere and you just pick them and take them back and I'll guarantee you bring a little handful of those. It won't matter that they're weeds. And just say, honey, I was just thinking about you on the way home and I just wanted to bring these to you and let's get us a little vase and put that in. I mean, anything that breaks the, the, the mundane living of life. When you do that, your wife perceives that as love. When the husband goes out of his way to sprinkle a little hot sauce on things, have a little bit of the element of surprise to add a little excitement to what can be a mundane life if you let it be, the wife says, he loves me. So those are the five laws for the men, sacrifice, honor, affirmation, security, and excitement. Let me hit the women laws real quick, all right? Okay, are you guys all right? Are we doing okay? We need to quit? Okay, let me get them. I'm gonna hit them real quick. All right, wife law number one, the law of the shepherd. The law of the shepherd. I'm gonna read uh, a few verses out of John 10 uh, quickly. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Well, of course, these verses are spoken about Christ and his church. But remember, Ephesians 5 has already linked the two together by talking about husbands loving your wife as Christ loved the church. So I think that, that this passage is really comparable to tell us that shepherds are protectors of the sheep. The original word for husband is the word husbandman, which is an, a, a, an agricultural identity. And we've just over the years shortened it to husband. So the concept is here that the shepherd would build a small corral and, and there would only be one door and at night the shepherd would lie in the door so that the only way that anyone could enter the sheepfold was to come over him. So another name for the concept of being a shepherd is headship. We know that we're all equal before God. We all know that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all know that in God there is no male and female. But of course, we also understand that God is the God of authority and someone must take the lead. I mean, 
Something with no head is dead, right? Something with two heads is, is a freak. But so someone has to be responsible. I mean, an automobile does not come with two steering wheels, right? Thank God for that. Uh, or two brake pedals, one on each side. Thank the Lord for that. But the Bible says that it is the husband who God holds responsible to be the head of this union. Ephesians 5, 23 and 24. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. So I would say to the wife, if your husband is willing to, to lay down his life for you as quickly as he would draw, draw his next breath. I mean, is it difficult to follow someone like that? Somebody that loves you enough to die for you at this moment? I, I submit to you that I wouldn't have any trouble following someone like that. Well, what if they lead us in the wrong direction? Well, sometimes we do lead you in the wrong direction. I mean, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we don't do everything right. Sometimes it might even be glaring and you might see it. But let me, let me just ask you to do this. Even if you see it, go with him and try not to remind him all the way along <laughs> about we're going in the wrong direction. We're going in the wrong direction. You're not doing this right. <laughs> There are three exceptions to this rule of following him, even if he's not, you know, going exactly the easiest course of life. And that is, you don't want to follow anything that's illegal. You don't want to follow anything that's immoral. And you don't want to follow anything that's unscriptural. Apart from those three areas of life, I mean, follow his lead. When you follow him, he will eventually discover if he's not doing it right or if he's going in a little wrong direction here. He'll discover that. And you can gently help him discover that. But follow his lead. He's the shepherd. And if you'll follow him, he will interpret that as respect. Wife law number two, the law of companionship. The five major needs of, of a man, and this first one will not surprise you, sexual fulfillment is number one. Recreational companionship is number two. Attractiveness of the spouse, or another word for that, trophy wife, is number three. Domestic support is number four, and admiration is number five. For a woman, just if you're interested, her first is affection. Now, just to show you how this happens, what, men, what is our number one need? Sexual fulfillment. Her number one need, affection. She'll give sexual fulfillment if we'll to, for, for us to give affection. I mean, it's really just a, it's a need, need deal. We do it all the time. So the second need of men, oh, let me give you the others for women. Second one, affections, number one, conversation, number two, honesty and openness, number three, financial support, number four, and family commitment is number five. Those are the top five needs that women have. So here we are with wife law number two, men need companionship. This is what baseball teams are about or bowling clubs or um, you know, some group at the VA or whatever it might be. Uh, this, is, this is what men are seeking when, that, when they're doing those kind of things is companionship. Uh, Malachi 2, verse 14. Malachi 2, 14. Uh, God says, you're guilty and you've robbed me and you've done these things. And then they say, how have we done it? And they do this about six or seven things. This is one of those things. Verse 14, Malachi 2. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So this is talking about divorce and how people are crazy about it. But God, the thing I want you to see is that God says that she, that she is your companion. 
Companion means a compatriot. It means uh, an associate. It means somebody that stands by your side. Now, remember I told you in the study that men communicated side by side, whereas women communicated face to face. Now, ladies, I know this is gonna sound weird, but men like to do stuff that doesn't take a lot of conversation. We like to be quiet in, in things. Uh, an example, James Dobson. How many of you ever, have ever heard of James Dobson? Focus, focus on the family. Uh, great, great guy, great, great teacher. He wrote a book called um, Love and Respect. And in his book, he had the story of a husband and a wife that went deer hunting. And he said, four hours, four hours they sat in a deer stand and didn't say a word. I'm sure that the wife was thinking of thousands of things that she could be doing. On the way out of the woods, they've been for four hours not saying a word, the husband looks at her and says, isn't this great? <laughs> and I'm sure you ladies are thinking, man, this would seem like the seventh ring of hell to, to me. <laughs> but I want you to notice what his idea, isn't this great? <laughs> this is the greatest thing. So what does that say? It says that we want you to be our companion. We desire that. Go, hey, let's go to a football game together. We'll sit there side by side. We'll watch the game. And it's all right if we talk a little about what's going on in the game or some kind of something like that. Uh, but we just sit there and watch the game. Uh, go, hey, look, I love to play golf. Come, let, come with me golfing. I hate golf. Well, drive the cart. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Uh, just be there. Watch TV. Sit side by side sometimes. Just watch a little TV. Uh, listen to some music together. I'm telling you, if guys, if, if, if your man likes music, nothing is, is more enjoyable to him than to have somebody that will enjoy music with him. He's like, listen to this. Listen. And, I mean, he can be the disc jockey and he starts playing these songs. Man, I do this all the time. Uh, I, I play those old 70s and stuff and, uh, you know, 60s. And I say, listen, to this. you remember this? And I know Tanya has got to be bored out of her mind about this, but, uh, but she acts like she's, you know, with me on this kind of stuff, you know. And this is just very enjoyable to me. And I, I'm, this is recreational companionship. And I know I don't have to say this, but do not be on that blooming cell phone. Do not be sitting there watching TV and he's watching, he's going, hey, did you? and he sees you and you over here with this mess. That right there is gonna be the death of everything. Get rid of that thing. Throw it in the garbage can somewhere. Put it in your bedroom. Don't, even, don't make it where you can hear a ding, ding. Oh, I got a text message. <laughs> you know, get, man, that's, re, that's killing more things than anything you can imagine. I'm serious. All right, wife law number three. The law of silence. <laughs> I know, I know, guys, you are wanting to look at your wife right now, but don't do it. Resist the urge to do that and just look straight ahead. Look at me, all right? Let me, let me do the talking because what I'm talking about here is a specific type of silence, all right? And you'll see it in just a second. Um, uh, when talking about uh, um, this specific type of silence, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 1, wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wife. What the law of silence says is when you sense, ladies, when you sense disrespect rising up inside of you over something that he's done or something that he didn't do, fight that feeling. Fight, resist the feeling to 
be disrespectful and to blast him in a disrespectful way when something happens and, and it's, it's obvious that he's made a mistake or he didn't do something he should. And that disrespect is just, whoo, fight it, fight that feeling. Because we men will give you many reasons to disrespect us. There are lots of things that we do and things that we don't do that will give you an opportunity to be disrespectful to us about our efforts. I mean, sometimes we're actually trying to help and we just stumble into something that happens and we were really trying to help. Uh, I've told you about this before when Tanya and I were first married for the first two years. Uh, we both worked, uh, went to school, um, and uh, we had a busy, and we were part-time at church with music and youth. So we had like two and a half jobs and every day was really busy. And so I worked near our trailer. We had a, we had a trailer and, and uh, so I would try to come home at lunch and uh, put some clothes on to wash and, or dry. And of course, my whites always got dingy. My colors faded. Um, and when I tried to dry stuff, I didn't always get it right. And I've told you about the sweater that Tanya had and I dried it and she came in and I said, I got good news and bad news. The good news is, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, let me give you the bad. The bad news is I shrunk the sweater. The good news is that if we have a daughter, she'll already have some wardrobe here. And of course, that could have been a major time where Tanya could have blasted me and obliterated me. You, why did you do that? Don't be, you know, just, she could have lamb blasted me about it. And, and I would have deserved it, although I was really trying to help. But, but don't do that. Um, I mean, our hearts are in the right place. We just have so many opportunities. And I mean, look, if you jump on us in front of other people or in front of the children or in front of any other uh, family member, man, don't do that. That is a kiss of death right there. And, and don't talk about him with other women or even men where he can overhear what you're saying. Like, you, you know that people can hear through walls, right? And that you're out on the porch and somebody inside can hear what you're saying. And don't let him overhear you say something like, well, I wish my husband was like you, yours because he can do anything. And my husband's such a klutz, man. He just, he hurts himself every time he tries to do something. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. It might be a little funny to you, but it ain't funny to him. And it's disrespectful and it cuts very deep. And so be careful, the law of, of, of silence. I mean, what that does, when you do that, it, is it opens a crack for someone else to convince him that he's wonderful. And I know you might not believe this, but no matter how awkward or unskilled your man may be, there's another sister out there who wishes she had him. So don't open that crack so that the devil can introduce something else in. This is respect, so the law of silence. Here's number four quickly, the law of beauty. The law of beauty, 1 Peter 3, verses three and four says, do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So, although we all agree that it is inner beauty that is most important, outer beauty does matter some. This verse says, don't let your adornment be merely. It says, be merely, not any. It doesn't say, not any. Uh, this is talking about my, my presentation of myself. Now, ladies, I'm going to say this, and I want you to believe it because it's absolutely true. 
The Lord made you beautiful. And the Lord made you attractive to men. And your husband loves you. He thinks you are beautiful. He, you are attractive to him. And remember, your husband has been made by God to be stimulated by what he sees. So as a respect to your husband and a respect really to yourself, it, my advice is to enhance yourself as much as possible. Um, thank God for makeup and beauty. I wish I could wear some. I know I need to. So I know y'all are going, oh, you can. Look, the Apostle Paul talks about the roles of husbands and wives. And I know this is talking about sex that I'm about to read. But I want to apply it to this about making yourself attractive as possible. I mean, you know, you don't have to dress up like a cosmopolitan model all the time. But to be, to be attractive, to present yourself that way. Uh, this is in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3 and 4. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have the authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, in application to this making yourself as attractive as possible for each other. Uh, just like the scripture says here that each of us, we can't fulfill everything that we need for ourselves. So our mates are commanded by God to fill the gap of whatever is needed. And this is talking, I said, about sexual things and not using it as a weapon and withholding and all that kind of stuff uh, because your body's not yours. It belongs to your husband and, yours belo and, and, and he belongs to you and so forth. But remember, God made him visually oriented and visually stimulated, so shake those curlers out. You know? I mean, before he gets home, uh, get them out. Uh, dress appropriately. It doesn't mean you have to doll up you know, like some model. But just wear something that's, you know, nice, uh, not like a bag of potatoes or something other like that. And, uh, and put on a little frou-frou, you know, smell good uh, when, when he comes home. Because most of the time, we, I mean, most of the time men have been working around other ladies or they've encountered other ladies during the day in the business world or wherever they, they are. And these women are dressed nice, they smell good, they have made themselves as presentable as possible. And so all I'm saying to you is, look, don't let him work in this kind of an environment and then come home to you and you look like something that the cats drug in and the dogs wouldn't drag back out. I mean, it, 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 it's disrespectful. I mean, look, it's disrespectful because here's what happens. If, you're having, if the plumber's coming to work on the sink that morning, you're going to get in there and put some makeup on and put a little something on so you don't look so unpresentable. And it's the blooming plumber. I mean, what, what difference does that make? Uh, so you do it for others. So if you don't do it for him, it's a sign of disrespect, really. So that, you see how subtle some of these things are. So anyway, that says, I love you. You're my man. I want to look good. I love you. Law number five. I know you're finally breathing a sigh of relief. Law, law number five, the law of mercy. Wife law number five, the law of mercy. You've had shepherd, companionship, silence, beauty, now mercy. All right. In John four, we have the woman at the well. Jesus confronts this woman who is wounded. This woman um, has had men in her life that have wounded her. And my goodness, there's so many wounded women in this world today. Uh, men can be cruel at times and heartless at times. Well, uh, this woman has given up on love because she has had five husbands and she is now living with someone who is not her husband. 
Now, we don't know what her problem was. It's never identified what the problem was. And the implication that most people take is, man, these five guys are really bad. Now, it doesn't say that. It, she might have had the problem. I don't know. Um, I mean, can five guys you know, be bad, all be wrong? Uh, but uh, whatever the problem was, um, it was, a, it was a problem. And so the devil loves to keep you in conflict over issues that come up in your life. That's why in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And the reason I call this point the law of mercy is because in relationships, we all need mercy because none of us are without fault. So there are going to be things that happen that you're just gonna have to let go. You're gonna have to let it go. I mean, I mean, plant, here's my suggestion. Plant a seed of the word to overcome a seed of the devil. The devil has, has you, you've had some issue and the devil has convinced your husband that he is a failure and that he's not the man that everybody needs him to be and that he can't get it right and that he never does anything right and so forth. Now, you have the opportunity to either pour on to that and increase his feeling and sense of this because you want to punish him because he's done something and it's made you mad and it didn't suit you just right. And so now you're going to, the devil is already beating on him. And now you're going to say something that's going to just add fuel to that fire. The law of mercy says don't do it. The law of mercy says none of us are perfect. You aren't, we aren't, none of us, and we all need mercy. And so instead of pouring fire on what the enemy has told him, take something from the word of God that will encourage him and just say it to him and let the Holy Spirit take that seed and work in his life. Instead of agreeing that he's some, you know, you'll never get it right. You're just like your daddy. You're no good. You never will be. You know, say this. Say something like, look, like, like Jeremiah 29, 11. Just say, you know, I know that was a mistake and we all make mistakes. So I, I just want to say, look, God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you future and a hope. So it's gonna be all right. God's gonna do that. And then, then let the Holy Spirit take that and use that positive word from God to overcome that assault from the enemy. I mean, hon, I know, look, this is a bad thing, but I, I don't want us to let this little small thing stand in the way of the great things that God's going to do in our lives. I'm with you. I love you. Hey, God's going to bless our lives. It'll be all right. The law of mercy. Don't beat it in, you know, to him. I mean, work it out. Help God work it out. I love what Billy Graham's wife said about Billy Graham. She said, it's not my job to straighten Billy out. It's my job to love him and to be a helpmate to him. It's God's job to straighten him out. And if we can remember that with, e with both sides of any issue, God didn't call us to straighten each other out. God called us to love each other and be a helpmate and let him do the straightening out because he will, he'll do it. If you'll get out of the way, he'll do the job. So anyway, there are your laws of marriage. If you obey those kind of things, you got a good chance. If you don't, uh, see you in divorce court, you know, <laughs> kind of like, or unhappy land. All right, let's bow our heads, please. <laughs>